One of the main points of the Second Vatican Council was to emphasize the importance of the Eucharistic liturgy in the worship of God and in the development of our own personal spiritual life. The Vatican Council strongly advised us that the sacrifice of the Holy Eucharist, the Mass, should be the principal expression of our faith and that of all other devotions should spring from the Mass and lead us back to the Mass. Eucharistic adoration does exactly that. And what they mean is we understand the sacrifice, Jesus dying on the cross, Jesus instituting this sacrament before his death the night before, and when we receive that, we understand that we are receiving that sacrament or that sacrifice. That sacrifice that Jesus does on the altar, we then receive. And that is a presence that should be permeating us. And that's why adoration is important, because it doesn't function on the sacrifice anymore, because mass is not occurring. It doesn't, function, it doesn't focus on communion, because you can't receive communion. It focuses primarily on the concept of presence, that Christ is present. So all experience, all existential experience, shows us that private prayer and adoration of the Lord in the Eucharist causes more frequent and more intense participation at Mass. Why? Because you're going to Mass and you're going to witness the sacrifice and you're going to receive him in communion. Now, if you've been in his presence, these two things are going to become automatically richer. If Jesus was standing next to you when you walked up to receive Holy Communion, or when you got up to Holy Communion, you didn't see the minister there, you saw Christ himself, that would change the way you would receive Holy Communion. It would have a profound effect on you to change you. So his presence always changes everything. We can see that throughout the gospel. Everything's in chaos, Jesus shows up, everything's fine. People are crying, somebody's dead, everybody's, oh, Jesus comes, everybody's thrown out, everybody's calm, everything's taken care of. His presence does that. And if we have his presence by us, then we also understand his sacrifice, because that's what he wants us to understand. So despite the teaching of the Second Vatican Council about the Holy Eucharist, Almost immediately after the Council, we begin to see a steady, tragic decline in respect for the Holy Eucharist. In some cases, the Mass seems to be transformed from the worship of God to the entertainment of the people and then to the worship of each other. Reverence for the Blessed Sacrament diminishes. Genuflections expressing our faith in the real presence of Jesus almost disappear. And prayerful silence in our churches gives way to socializing and so-called community building. For many, the church became a social hall instead of a sacred place for prayer and worship. The sacrifice of the Mass was often used as a vehicle for political statements. Eucharistic devotions were ridiculed as old church and almost disappeared from the Catholic scene. Today, we have a generation of two of young Catholics who have never seen benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. And I was hard found to find anyone in our school, among our school children, who even knew what it was, let alone have never seen it. So even the concept of saying benediction, they have no cognitive understanding of what that word means. So they can't, like, we can picture what it is. There's no thing for them to picture. They don't even know it. So, every, um, so what happens then? Well, after a period of time, we have Blessed John Paul II come on the scene. This is why Pope John Paul II has led a counterattack to restore the Eucharist to its rightful place in worship and in spiritual life of the church. And he has called upon saints like Blessed Pier Giorgio Fersati to lead and call back the youth of the world in this regard. Every year, and this I thought, thought was interesting, every year of his pontificate, Pope John Paul II wrote a pastoral letter about the Holy Eucharist to all bishops and priests of the world. In these letters, the Holy Father demand a stop of the abuses being committed against the Blessed Sacrament. He pleaded for a return to the reverence and traditions of the past, especially for the adoration of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. This, more or less, fell on dead ears. 
So Pope John Paul II tried to reinforce his words with action, and in 1991, Pope John Paul II began perpetual adoration of the Eucharist in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And also in that same year, the Holy Father approved the canonical establishment of the lay associates for perpetual adoration to promote adoration in every Catholic parish in the world. That was 1991. So 21 years later, how many parishes still do not have Eucharistic adoration? And then we wonder why we're so confused as Catholics. We're not even doing what we're being asked to do by the Holy Father. So Pope John Paul II says, the church and the world have a great need of Eucharistic worship. Jesus waits for us in this sacrament of love. Let us be generous with our time in going to him and meeting him in adoration. Notice how the Holy Father is not asking you to be generous with anything else but your time. He's not asking for your money, but something more precious, your time. Of course, I've also heard some objections to Eucharistic adoration. Some complain that Eucharistic adoration is too private, too personal, and even too quiet. This complaint seems to be based on the idea that our worship of God must always be a communal exercise. It must always invoke a lot of people, which much activity, and maybe even a lot of noise. Prayer does not always have to be seen this way. Jesus shows us that prayer, and looking at the example of his life, that, his, that this prayer life was a good practicing Jew. Jesus faithfully practiced public worship of God. He attended services at the temple in Jerusalem or the local synagogue, and he even assisted at those celebrations so that we can see that by Jesus' good example that we must frequently also go off to pray like he did. He prayed in the desert on top of mountains to be alone with the Father, to commune with his Father privately in prayer, to worship, to thank, to ask for help and strength, especially before the major events and decisions of his life. Jesus prayed in private for 40 days in the desert before beginning his public ministry. Again, before choosing the 12 apostles from among his disciples, Jesus spent the whole night in private prayer the night before he died, and Jesus prayed alone to his Father asking for strength to bear the sufferings that he knew what he would have to endure. We should follow this example of Jesus also. Sometimes those who object to Eucharistic adoration complain that adoration is too much Jesus and I. They charge that adoration intends to be selfish, turning our thoughts and our intentions inward instead of reaching out to others. Again, an obvious response is to look at Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta and her sisters, and just to mention the time they spend in private prayer and adoration. I don't doubt anyone could match their concern for their neighbor, especially for the most desperate and the abandoned. With participation in the Eucharist and its emphasis on the Mass as communal worship, a new problem starts to arise, an unfortunate side effect. Some Catholics now have the idea that there is no longer any need for personal or private prayer. Even at non-liturgical devotions, such as the Rosary or the Stations of the Cross, Novenas and Benediction, that all of these are now obsolete. Some even go so far as to say that such devotions are discouraged and even forbidden by the Second Vatican Council. And that is utter nonsense. <coughs> so, there is nothing in the Second Vatican Council documents that supports any of these ideas. In fact, the Council says just the opposite. In the Constitution on the Liturgy, the Council says the spiritual life is not limited solely to the participation in the Liturgy. So that means our spiritual lives are not just fed just when we go to Mass. In fact, if you just go to Mass, it's probably not enough. Now, community worship is something I thought the Pope pointed out that was interesting is, if we want our community worship to be better, if we want our Masses to be better, then that depends on our personal prayer. Trying to build a community prayer without personal prayer is like trying to build a brick church without the individual bricks. Proper participation of the liturgy 
and communal worship can only be achieved by a soul prepared and energized by personal devotion and private prayer. Those who habitually criticize the past and the old ways of charged that Catholics at Mass concentrate only on the externals, but too often today participation in the Mass is just that, concentration on the externals, the Mass, the music, the banners, the symbols, and all the apparent realization that the great mystery and sacrifice being reenacted in the altar is forgotten. That realization only comes from personal prayer and meditation. So the Holy Father is saying is, we have to have this concept of presence if it's going to enrich our community or our sacrifice of the Mass. So, the same thing applies to our spiritual life. The soul needs spiritual food of the Eucharist. The spirit rests on meditation and the spiritual air of prayer. Without the proper nourishment, the human soul cannot mature and flourish spiritually. I want to repeat that. Without proper spiritual nourishment, the human soul cannot mature or flourish spiritually. So if you want to know why everybody in the church <coughs> seems immature or unspiritual, it's because they are not being nourished. Because the sacrifice can't give you the nourishment. The nourishment is only going to come from the communion. When you receive it, then it's nourishment to you. Or when you're in the presence of him who can nourish you. So if all you do is go to Mass, it's like having a diet and all you're eating is steak. Ask your doctor what's going to happen to you if you just have a steady diet of steak. No vegetables, no fruit, just steak. It's not healthy. Same in the spiritual life. You have to have all three if you want to be healthy. You have to think of it as steak, and your vegetables, your fruit, and your meat. It can't just be the one. So. If we want to be nourished, then the individual cannot just go to Mass. He has to fulfill his role by worshiping God as a member of the community, and then the individual go through the motions, not just a public prayer, singing, standing, and sitting, and only in an external worship form, but missing is the eternal, internal worship, which results only from personal communication with God. Just as air is essential to physical life, so prayer is essential to the spiritual life. When you stop breathing, you are physically dead. When you stop praying, you are spiritually dead. That's Teresa of Avila. I mean, that's simple. You don't pray, you're dead. And the dead don't grow, they corrupt. And they don't just corrupt themselves, they corrupt everyone around them. So if you're wondering why this church sometimes feels corrupt, it's because we're corrupting each other with our own sinfulness. And this is why St. Paul will say to, his, to the Corinthians, watch out that you don't consume each other because you're going to get to the point where it's not going to be enough because you're not sustaining yourself with God. You're sustaining yourself with other things other than Him. And so you're going to start turning on each other. And watch out if you don't eat each other. So some of you might be wondering why I'm making such a big issue of this. Well, I think it is so important to be talking about this subject now. After all, the doctrine of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist has been at the heart of our Catholic faith, devotion, and worship from the beginning of Christianity. But, as we all know, the current symptoms in our church tell us it's time again to do some serious thinking about the awesome gift that Jesus gave us. We're all familiar with the survey conducted a few years ago that sadly showed the state of some Catholics. And it even concluded that only 27% of Catholics believe in the real presence as the church teaches it. Now, personally, I think that the observers of this survey may have skewed the results a little bit. I don't think that it is only 27% believe. It might have been only 25% who actually knew the teachings of the church. That's our problem. That's the biggest problem, a case of simple lack of knowledge. 
Most of Catholics do not know what they believe or why they believe it. Catholics should believe, or even what they shouldn't believe. They simply have not been taught the Catholic faith. Look at the condition of Catholic education for the past 35 years. Fortunately, the Catholic bishops have finally realized that it is a disaster. A few years ago, the Archbishop, who heads the Commission on Education, publicly declared that the Catholic religious education is in shambles and has been that way for the last 30 years. The result of this is two or three generation of young Catholics who know virtually nothing about their faith. They do not know what they are to believe or why they believe it. And the older generations have heard very little to reinforce what they have learned from their youth. So obviously we have a lot of re-education to do. Now one of the best aspects of Eucharistic adoration, and I think this is where our re-education can kind of come from, the best thing I think about Eucharistic adoration is how you spend your time with Jesus is completely up to you. When you want to do Eucharistic adoration, there is no set formula. You want to go in there and read, that's fine. No one is preaching to you, no one's telling you what to do, no one's telling you to sing, no one's telling you to stand, sit, kneel, or do whatever. You are completely on your own. You can go into the Adoration Chapel. There are going to be books available, some about Holy Hour devotions, some just about the saints, to help you get started if you need them. But most of us do need those things at times. So don't think like, oh my gosh, I have to use this book. If you have to use it, you want to use it, use it. It's your time. You can do whatever you want. You can spend your time with Jesus any way you want. You can pray your rosary, you can read your Bible, or you can do some other spiritual reading. Remember, you are there to visit with Jesus, and that's the most important thing. To talk with Him, to tell Him your problems, your needs or your concerns, to tell Him about your joys too. Chances are He hasn't heard probably those very often. So all you do is take a little time out of your private visit with Jesus and your Savior. The whole purpose of human existence is to look forward to and to live that way that we are going to be in the Blessed Trinity's presence for all eternity. So if we can't sit five minutes with Jesus, what do we think we're going to be doing all eternity? It's a good way to start now. So this is why thousands of people from across the country will testify that one hour each week with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament is the most peaceful and the most satisfying hour of their whole week. Um, about a, two or three months ago, there was a young man who came to our parish. He's not from here. He was camping in the area, and he said that in his home parish, they have Eucharistic adoration. And he said when Father first suggested it, no one wanted to do it. He said everyone was, oh, no, I don't want to do this. This is Father's craziness, and I ain't going to do it. But he said, I thought since Father asked that I would take an hour. And he said, it was the greatest thing that has ever happened to me that I know I get to go and spend an hour with Jesus once a week. And he said, no matter how much your people complain, do not stop this. If for their good, make sure you get this chapel in your parish. So we can take his testimonial that this has a lot of good for us. Now, do we have any questions? I don't want to jump to the next section and we'll leave anybody behind. Any of that confusing or? Okay. An understanding of history. First of all, how many of you guys have ever taken a history course in graduate school? All right. So historical development and all that is just like all new to all of you, huh? Okay. All right. In what the church never realized is for close to 1900 years, it had always done a good job of keeping records and keeping testimonials from people. If a pope wrote a letter, it was kept. It didn't matter who the letter went to. Everything was kept. And they thought that was history. That's what they called history. Just the collection of all this information. But it was never written into any kind of a history. It was just if you wanted to know what Pope so-and-so said, well, then go pull out his files and go see what he said.
but there was never a concept or a flowingness to it. It was just stored information. Well, at the turn of the century in the 1900s, the church started realizing that actually in that 1900 years of, of history, Jesus is revealing us himself to us through it. So it was a new concept. I never thought that God was, was one of the instruments by which he reveals us his history. We think, you know, nature shows us God because we can look how beautiful it is and how magnificent we can, you know, extrapolate that God created this. But we never thought we could do that with history. And history, that's why now you cannot go to a college and get a degree in church history anymore. You have to get a degree in what's called historical theology. Because what the church started to do is it started to look at historical thought, not necessarily collection of data. So instead of saying, what did Pope so-and-so say, the question would be, has anybody ever talked on the subject of X? And who's done it? Now you look at all that information throughout history of what we have said, the church has said, about a given subject, okay? Instead of just accumulation of dates and data. All right, now, when that happened, that broke out into a fight that most of us didn't know occurred. But in the 1950s in France, it's always the French, we can blame it on that. <laughs> There started a fight between the Dominicans, a religious order, and the Jesuits, another religious order. Now what the Dominicans said is, they said that they've noticed that through time there is what's called the development of doctrine. That over time we learn things and we get to know things and we develop new thoughts that the apostles never could have ever conceived of. A great example of this would be bioethics. The apostles wouldn't have known anything about bioethics, but we know a ton of it because we live in this century. Now what the Jesuits said is no, 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 no. There is always the sources. Jesus, what he revealed in when he came as man. And that is our job. We are always to go to the resource, back to the source, and the source tells us what to do in every given age. So nothing develops new, everything's been revealed, there's nothing new under the sun kind of theory. Okay? Jesus told us everything, and that's it. All right, now, you can see the opposing problem with these two ideas. Well, it didn't get nice. The Dominicans started firing all their Jesuit professors in their universities. And the Jesuit universities started firing all their Dominicans. To the point that these two religious orders were causing chaos throughout the religious system that now was bleeding not into just France, but into Germany and Italy. Okay? So at the time, Pius XII calls the head of the Jesuit order in and the head of the Dominican order in and said, this fighting will stop immediately or I will excommunicate both religious orders. You're talking thousands of people he was threatening to excommunicate because he didn't want this to, to get ugly and it was getting ugly. So all this was put on the back burner, okay? Then when the council, the Vatican council started, all of this came to the forefront because it was a problem already that wasn't discussed and needed to be clarified and therefore when the French and German bishops arrived in Italy for the conclave they already were coming in fighting in a sense over these issues. Okay, now what the church decides at Second Vatican Council is yes, Jesus revealed everything when he came but we humans are not very smart so it takes us a little time to catch on exactly what he meant. You can see this exactly in the apostles. The apostles took them a long time to catch on exactly what Jesus was saying and meaning. So over time, we do catch on to something that maybe a previous generation maybe knew, but didn't see the importance of that because it didn't apply to their everyday life. So there is the understanding of both. Yes, Jesus reveals all, and yes, over time, because of that revelation, we learn new things, like bioethics. 
we can take the revelation of Jesus and apply it to biomedical field. We can take this, this thing and we can apply it to any field of study. Okay? So this is what comes out of Vatican II. Now, so that we're on the same page, when I mean development of doctrine, I mean that some divine revealed truth, meaning Jesus, oops, Jesus divinely revealed it, that the more deeply understood and more clearly perceived than it had been before, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, whom Christ promised to send to teach us, the church comes to see more deeply what she had already believed and the resulting insight finds expression in devotions of the faithful that may have been quite uncommon in the church's previous history. Perfect example is the rosary. Before the 13th century, there wasn't a Catholic in the world who knew what the rosary was. It wasn't invented yet. Then after St. Dominic invents the rosary, then now most Catholics, most Catholics know what a rosary is. But if you would have went back to the 10th century or to the 9th century, they would all looked at you like, What's a ro what the heck is that? They wouldn't even know what it is. Okay? So, always implied in such progress is that objectively the revealed truth remains constant and unchanged. But through the light of the Holy Spirit, the subjective understanding of the truth becomes more clear. Its meaning becomes more certain as it is grasped by the believing mind becoming increasingly more firm in what's revealed. Okay? Does there any questions about this? Because I, I want to make sure we, I have the understanding of this before we go any farther because this colors our, how we look at history. Okay? Mm -hmm. It affects the way we do church history because we can look at now not just the development of people and the church in that way, but we can actually study the development of ideas in the church. And see, that's what I'm going to do next, is we're going to start with history, starting with the apostles, going to the present, what the church taught about the Eucharist, so we can see the connection of Eucharistic adoration in its history. Okay? So that's what we would do at next class, but before we, I dismiss you, I want to make sure that you guys understand what's going on between these two and how it leads us to where we are in 2012. Any questions about that? I know I'm not that good of a teacher, so I know there has to be questions. <laughs> so you're saying they disagreed, but Vatican II brought the two together? Yes. The two ideas together? Right. As, long as, as long as you hold that this part of it is unchanging. So what Jesus revealed to us doesn't change over time. It's unchanging. What changes is us, the receiver. The mode of, as they say in philosophy, it's the mode of the receiver. It's the way we receive existentially our experience of hearing the divine word being preached to us. What does that do in our mind can develop over time. But the actual, what is being preached or revealed is unchanging. That's why if you ever notice, if you read the Bible a lot, you'll read a passage and it doesn't mean anything to you. And then you go back like five years later and you read the same passage, it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know this was in here. But you know you've had to have read it before because you know you read all of Matthew. It's because of this. It's the development. The word is unchanging, but how does it affect me different today than it did five years ago? Is the Holy Spirit working in you and developing you into being a better Christian? Okay? And see, what happens in that is that's what Eucharistic adoration technically does. It's that development in us so that we're fine-tuned enough that we can see Jesus when he isn't sometimes physically present. Because if you always think Jesus is next to you, you are far le likely to do anything bad. I, I had had a talk in a men's group once, and I said, do you ever notice like when you hit your hammer on your thumb and you scream out all kinds of cuss words? And they're like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I said, but if your granddaughter or your grandson is next to you, you will do the same action, but you won't say anything? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I don't want to cuss in front of my grandchildren. And I'm like, you won't cuss in front of your God, grandchildren, but God is there every time you hit your hammer. So it's okay to cuss in front of God, but not your grandchildren? It's because we don't understand this presence thing. That's what we lack as Catholics nowadays. Okay?